Welcome back. We are on the generalization assignment for lab two. In this video, I'm going to work through all of the six problems, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the advanced problem that is not actually part of the assignment. So let's check out the instructions and you can follow along with this video if you need help. I encourage you to try to do all of these things on your own and um, use this video when you get stuck. So first of all, I'm gonna ask you to work inside the R project Stats Lab 1 that you made for Lab 1. So I'm gonna go get mine working. I'm gonna go to, uh, what was it called? Stats Lab 1. There it is. And here's where I did my Lab 1. Great, I'm gonna make Lab 2. I think that's the next step. Create a new R Markdown document called lab2.rmd. Great. Actually, I'm just going to copy this one. Click it, copy, I'm going to call it lab2. Press OK. Now we've made a lab2. I'm going to quickly open this up, call it lab2, and I'm going to go, I'm going to delete everything from before. And I saved it. I'm going to knit it just to see. Yeah, there we go, blank document. And as I've been encouraging you to do, commit your work regularly so that I can follow it along on GitHub. So I'm just going to do that. Uh, did I? Actually, good question. Is Where is this stuff? Is has a, yeah, there it is, Stats Lab 1. So I've made these changes. Let's add Lab 2, commit, and push. Uh, so I will be doing this process regularly so that my current work is up on GitHub. And by the way, uh, when you have issues with your code that you'd like me to look over, it's super helpful if you can send me a link to your lab.rmd file so I can look at that and make comments to help you. Okay, so we're going to go work through these six problems. Your job is to produce a lab2.rmd showing that you work through all these problems, upload it to GitHub, and then send the link to the Blackboard uh, to submit for lab2. It'll be due next week. There's a new ask in here, number four. For each problem, I want you to make a note about how much of the problem you believe you can solve independently without help. For example, Currently, for Lab 1 and Lab 2, in addition to the problems I'm asking you to solve, you have available to you these solution videos. And it's totally okay at this point if you need to work through the labs by following along with the solution video. Um, however, I'd like you to assess for yourself in this lab uh, whether or not you solve the problems by yourself or with help or somewhere in between. So when you solve each problem, I want you to just make a little note at the end or somewhere in your markdown document. It gives me a number between zero and 100. Zero uh, is that you are um, thinking you need to copy the answers in order to solve the problem, so you can't do it independently. A 100 is, yep, yeah, you could totally do this by yourself and you don't need the solutions video to help you. So I will do that as well throughout, just to show you what I do. Um, so just like last time, let's see if we can just quickly copy this stuff, all the problems, pop them right into our markdown document. So that's problem one, that's problem two, three, four, Five. Is there a six? I miss it. One. Oh, there's two. Oops. All right, I went and fixed all of those. So let's just take a look. We've got the problems in there. Let's go and start solving them. So the first one is potentially the longest. And we're asking you to use R to demonstrate that the mean minimizes the sum of the squared deviations from the mean and accomplish the following steps. 
produce a sample of at least 10 or more different numbers. Produce a simulation following the example from the concepts section. Use your simulation to test a range of smaller and larger, a range of numbers smaller and larger than the mean to show that the mean minimizes the sum of the squared deviations from the mean. Plot your results. Great. Let's start with some numbers. I need 10 or more different numbers. I'm going to just quickly enter some numbers in here. And that looks like 10 or more to me. Are we good? Let's, uh, we could count them. We could go length. Yeah, I've got more than 10. Great. So the next thing I want to do is follow along from what we did before uh, in the concepts version of lab two and create a similar simulation. Um, basically what I'm asking you to do at this point is go back up here and let's see if we can copy out some of this code that we used and to demonstrate that the mean is the point from which the sum of the deviations is zero. Let's use similar code to look about the sum of the squared deviations being minimized. It's slightly different, but it is related. So for example, I think we could start here. Let's copy out uh, just this part. All right. So, oh yeah, previously I called this scores. I'm just gonna change that. So now I'm saving my values in the variable scores. We're gonna test the numbers um, minimum to maximum and see if we might need to change this, but let's try it out. Numbers to test. So we're gonna test the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, let's just quickly find out what is the mean of our numbers. That's 4.428571. Oh, all right. Um, so we're being asked to demonstrate that the mean minimizes the sum of the square deviations from the mean. And we want to test a range of numbers smaller and s larger than the mean. Okay. What should our range of numbers be that are smaller and larger than the mean? So previously, we tested the numbers from the smallest number in the scores to the largest number, which was going to be an 8 probably in here. This is slightly different from what's being asked. We want to, I mean, we could, we could maybe do this by hand if we wanted. Um, here's a way to do it. I want to get some numbers. I mean, I already found out that the mean is 4.428571. So here are some numbers that are smaller than the mean, one, two, three, and four. Then I could have the mean, right? And then I could have some more numbers higher than the mean. So all of these numbers are just a little bit below, then we've got the mean, and then we've got numbers above. If these were the numbers we were testing, what we should show here is that the sum of the squared deviations between the scores in each of these numbers is minimized as we approach the mean value. Okay, so previously we were looking at the sum of the deviations, but now we want to look at the sum of the squared deviations. So I've just added an SQ in there because that will help us be meaningful when we create our variable names. And all we really need to do is modify this inside part rather than taking the deviations between the scores and one of our numbers in here. We want to take the squared deviations. So if we can wrap this in parentheses. We can use the hat and put a hat two. For example, two hat two is uh, squaring the value. So we can square our deviations and then sum them up. So this will produce a sum of square deviations for each of 
between the scores and each of these test values. Now I'm just going to add in sq just so that this variable name is the same as this one. We also want it to be the same as this one down here when we print it out. And I can just press play and we can see these numbers. It would be helpful just to look at the numbers and that's what we've been asked to do. Plot the numbers. And we can see that um, values before the mean, uh, how many values do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We should have nine dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm not sure why we only have eight and not nine. And I've discovered the reason why. And it's a minor little detail here. I was, let's take a look at numbers to test. Let's see if we can figure out the problem. So these numbers are one, two, three, four, a funny number, which is the mean, and five, six, seven, eight. All of the integer values would be appropriate to assign as positions into this vector. So for example, the first iteration of the loop when i is a one, we can put this sum into position one, then we can put it into position two and so on. However, what do you think happens when it gets to the fifth number? There is no such thing as position 4.428571 in this vector, so it fails to be assigned. We need to change our loop a little bit here. And um, for, for example, uh, we need to separate in our minds and in the code uh, positions that we want to assign into. So the positions, let's use those as i. Those are gonna be going into the ith position of the sum square deviations variable. And we also want to think about different test numbers. So these are two different things. We're conflating them right now in our example. So I'm gonna do it like this. Our loop will go from one to the number of numbers to test. There are nine numbers. So this is a sequence of one to nine. These numbers will systematically go into the variable i, allowing us to sign, assign in values one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of this vector. Next, we want to test specific values those are the values that are in the positions of one to nine of the numbers to test variable. So our final code will look something like this. And if we run it, now we can see that uh, as we get closer to the mean value, which is represented here in the plot, we have the smallest sum of square deviations. And as we move away from it on both sides, the sum of the square deviations increases. The, and that is the property of the mean we're intending to demonstrate. All right, we've solved the problem. We've done it in a little bit of a hacky way. And what I wanna do, one more example of this problem where we vary exactly which numbers we're testing here. So we only tested nine numbers. We didn't test numbers that were really close to the mean. Uh, what if we wanted to test a more uh, fine grain number of numbers and then around this mean rather than the nine that we did test? And this gets back to the problem of testing a range of numbers smaller and larger than the mean. So I'm just gonna comment out this line and I'm gonna do another version of this variable, numbers to test. Let's see if we can give an example here that's testing a wider range of narrower numbers, if you get what I mean. So we make a vector. First of all, we're going to make some numbers using this seek function. We're gonna go, let's go from, I don't know, the number one to 
the mean of scores. And we're going to make a sequence in steps of 0.25. So we see something like this. So now we're getting close to the mean here. We could, we could even make this even more fine grain in steps of 0.1. So now we're going lots of numbers between one and getting real close to the mean value. Let's try this one. So we've got values that approach the mean here. Now we're gonna have the exact mean and we're going to make another sequence that starts at the mean, oh, sorry, that starts at the mean, yep, and goes up to what we want to, we have to choose a number to go up to, how about eight, which is the largest number in that sequence. We're gonna go up in steps of 0.1. So we should make a big long sequence here of numbers, right? starting at one and then going all the way through up to almost we get to eight. And the, the, there is an example of the mean right here, 4.428571. So if we repeat running this code, we'll see we've tested more spots in between smaller values and larger values. And again, the mean value is uh, the one that minimizes these sums of squared deviations. So this would be a way of solving the problem. And now that I've solved the problem, remember in the assignment, I've asked you, uh, let's go down to the generalization assignment, I've asked you to make a note about how much of the problem you believe you can solve independently without help. Let's, uh, for me, I'm just going to um, put confidence here. And I mean, I, I solved this problem without any help, I'm making the video. So I'm gonna put 100 here because I'm 100% confident that I can solve this problem by myself. Uh, if you were 0% confident, put a zero or somewhere in between, uh, that's fine. So, you know, I'm gonna be putting 100 for all of these probably unless I can't solve the problem. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is for you to start to assess where you're at in terms of following along in terms of copying solutions, which is totally fine at this point for learning, and where you are in terms of, oh yeah, I think I'm getting some of the concepts and I think I can do this uh, without, uh, without help. And the goal is by the end of the course, um, we'll be transitioning from needing lots of examples and, and help to having some independent concepts uh, and you feeling justifiably confident that you can solve these kinds of problems. Um, all right, so I solved problem one. Um, I knit the document. We can see the examples here. Uh, actually, I don't want to print all those numbers. So <clears throat> I'm going to re-knit the document. And just to save my work, I'm going to say lab two, P1 solved. I commit that and push it. Let's go on to problem number two. I'll just make a note here. We're on problem number two. <clears throat> and the problem is to write a custom R function for any one of the following descriptive statistics, median mode, standard deviation, variance, and then demonstrate that it produces the same value as the base R function given some set of numbers. Ooh, I should, <clears throat> I should warn you now there is no base R function for the mode, so you can't do that test. And um, I'm only asking you to do one of these. However, I will go ahead and solve all of them. So problem two, median. Problem two, median. Remember, the median is the literal middle number in a list of ordered numbers. So how can we write a median function? And I'm gonna call it my median, save. So 
uh, I could just go ahead and write all of these functions. Th this solving problem two is going to take a little while because I'm going to I'm going to talk out loud a little bit as I solve this problem to show you how I go about doing it. So let's say we had some numbers. Um, so here's some numbers. And, you know, your numbers could be different. It doesn't really matter. But they're in a vector. Now, I know that I need to sort these numbers from the smallest to the largest and put them in order. So how could I do that? You could go to Google. You could look up how to sort numbers, how to order numbers. I haven't told you how to do this yet. It turns out there is a function called sort, and it will order numbers. So if we do sort A, it goes from smallest to largest. So that's useful. I'm just going to put a little note here that if I do that, it works. Now, the median is the number in the middle here, in the middle position. So if we've got kind of a vector with all these things in it, you have to go and find the middle place, the middle slot, and ask what number is that. If there are uh, an even number of slots, then your median is this number plus this number divided by two. So we have to handle odd and even vectors, ones that have odd or even numbers of things. So first of all, how long is this one? Okay, it's, it's an even one. So um, we're going to have to find the middle positions of this. And we can do that in a couple different ways. I'm going to use a variable m1 to refer to the first middle position. Now I'm working with 12. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. It might, it might be hard to see, but there's six numbers on this side and six numbers on that side. Um, how do I split up this number? Well, if I did length a divided by two, I'd get a six. All right, so m1 is going to be length a divided by two. And that's referring to the first middle slot. Now M2 is going to be the second middle slot. And we know that's going to be, I mean, length, length A divided by 2 gets the first one. That's a 6. The next one is this number plus 1, right? So we can do the same thing. Length A divided by 2. And then we go plus 1. So now M1 is going to be a 6. And M2 is going to be a 7. So that means we could go a square index m1 for a 3. Ooh, actually I need to do something. I'm going to save sorted a. I'm going to save our sorted version of our variables here. So we can see in here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The sixth thing is a 4. Okay. And so a m1 should be a 4. Sorry. Sorted a m1 should be a 4. And actually the seventh thing is also a 4. So that's m2. That's also a 4. And now the formula is, in this case, the answer is going to be the same. Um, but it's this one plus that one all divided by, oops, all divided by 2. So we found the median here for an even vector. And what I've been doing is just working through the problem for an even vector. I'm just going to copy all of this and I'm going to take one of these numbers out. So now we've only got uh, 11 numbers right there. And that means there's a middle number, one, two, three, four, five, 
this is the middle number, and then we've got five more. So the middle number, how do we find the middle number here? First thing, I'm just going to erase some of this work. Um, right, when we have an odd number of numbers, we sort them, and then we're trying to find the middle number. And so in this case, we have 11 numbers, right? Let's just double check. 11 numbers in our variable. Now, if we do 11 divided by 2, we're going to get 5.5. There is no position 5.5 in here. There is a position 6, and that's the one we're trying to get to. There's a little trick. Um, we could add 0.5 to this value, and then we would get to position 6. And that would work for um, the different values that we could find, like if there was... Um, if there was 17 numbers in your sequence, right, then if you divide by 2, you get 8.5. Well, if you then add 0.5, you'll get a 9. And if you have 8 numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then 1 number, which is 9, and then 8 more numbers, all of that adds up to 17. Another way to do it, let's say you had 8.5, we're trying to make a 9, uh, there's a function in R called round. That should round to the nearest integer. Now let's watch what happens with round. This is pretty mission critical. R by default rounds up, or sorry, pff, rounds down, whereas you would normally think it would round up. There's a question, is this something we can change? So let's look up round. And we'll see that, uh, we'll learn that round, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. And there's a version of this called ceiling. Let's see if ceiling does what we want it to do. 8.5 and ceiling goes up. So, Let's use ceiling here. So we could use ceiling on this. So remember, we've got a vector of 11 numbers. They're now sorted. And we want to figure out what the middle number is. We could use this um, ceiling of the length of A divided by 2. So then we could go into the variable sorted A at this location, I'm just going to copy this all in, which is going to find the middle location. And oops, there was a mistake. And it's going to go in there and return the median. So uh, just to look at this, the sixth number here, one, two, three, four, five, six, is the median. All right. I'm just making some notes to myself that. These are the two ways we are, we're going to, to work this out. Um, so in my median function, we're going to take an input. There's going to be some numbers coming in. We're going to compute the length of these numbers. We're going to ask the question, do we, are we de dealing with an odd number or an even number? So we've used the mod functions before for this, the modulus. And if, if a value mod 2 equals 0, then there is no remainder, and we're dealing with the even number, or even numbers. All right, so we can kind of go up here and copy some of our code. And let's do that. I'm going to copy this and see what I can reuse. I'm highlighting these things. I'm pressing tab just to get it all lined up like this. And uh, we're dealing with A's in the previous code. And in my function, I'm dealing with X's. It turns out that 
we can highlight all of these things and do a find. So I did Command F. I'm searching for A's in the selection on replace with X. So I can just quickly change all the A's to X's. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sort the numbers in the X input. We don't need to calculate that independently. We're going to get the um, first middle position and the second middle position. And then we're going to return this calculation. going to add an else statement here and um, put in the code for the odd version of this, which looks like this here. I'm going to copy this, put it in here, highlight these parts, tab it out, and again, highlight this, do find A, replace with X, to get all those X's changed. So we're going to sort the X and um, we don't need to do this. We can return the number in the middle position of X. All right, so there's a median function. Let's see if it works. I'm going to take some test numbers. Oh, here's our test numbers. So that returns a median of four. We could test that against the actual median function, which also returns a four. I want to note I chose a kind of complicated one to begin with. In our class, we haven't really discussed logic statements such as if and else statements too much. But as you can see in this function, we've used it to control doing one thing under one condition and doing another thing on a different condition. So for now, just follow along with these examples and we will discuss these details of our programming um, in another lecture. Make another code chunk and I'm going to go up and say Let's do the mode. So the mode is the most frequently occurring number in a set of numbers. I'm just going to borrow our set of numbers up here. So we're starting with something. Now, which number in here occurs the most frequently? We would have to go through each number and count out how many times they occur. We can see there's one, one, um, two fives, three fours, three threes, one two, and one five, one six, one seven. So um, the most frequently occurring number is a three and a four, they're tied. So how would you write a mode function? Well, you'd have to go and uh, count up every time each unique number occurs. And there's more than one way to do that in R. I'm going to show you a quick way using the table function. So if we use the table function, it does all the work for us in one go. Up at the top of the table, we can see all the unique different things that occur. These are the different numbers in the set. And then underneath, we can see um, the counts. And so we can see that the numbers that occur the most are tied, 3 and 3. We've got a 3 and 4 here. Uh, so the next problem we have <laughs> is to try to interpret the results of table in order to extract out a mode and uh, have the function return the values with the maximum counts. When we produce a table object, let's just see what happens. Like, I'm going to store the results of this table into a variable b. So now we look at this, we can see the table gets printed back. Um, it's a class of table, and I happen to know that there's two things going on. At the top of this, these are the names of 
the table, the columns, and these are the values in the table. So if we were to say names B, we would see that each of the different numbers that could possibly, these are all the unique things that exist in the sequence, they're given names in the table. And uh, what we want to basically do is we want to find the largest values or the largest frequency counts in the table, which happen to be these two threes, and we want to figure out the names associated with those things. So we're asking a question that uses the which function again, something like which things in our table stored as B are equal to the maximum values in B. When we do this, we return another little table object, which again has names at the top and values uh, um, oh, these, like, what has been returned here? I guess it's just giving us the names three and four. So in some sense, this is our answer. I suppose we could convert this back to a normal kind of number using the as.numeric function and we have our answer. I think this is how this is working. Let's say we added um, a bunch more eights in here, right? Now eight is obviously the correct answer because there's a lot of eights. It's the most frequently occurring number. Let's take a look at our table. Now 10 is the biggest number. So when we, would, we do this part, we should get, um, sorry, 10 is the biggest count and we return the eight, which is the name of the column with 10 things in it. So I'm just going to quickly convert this to a function. And we are going to table, oh, I mean, we could just kind of borrow this exactly as it is. It's not A coming in, it's X coming in now. We're creating this little table, putting in the B variables. It's not very good descriptive language, but for now we'll just go with it. And then we're returning this last thing. And now we have a function to return the mode. Okay, two more, the standard deviation and the variance. These are both related to each other. How about I start with the variance? So if you remember the formula for the variance, what we're doing is we're calculating the sum of all of our scores minus the mean squared and dividing by, let's in this case, divide by n for the population. We could divide by n minus one, that's the way that r does it, but for now, Let's just do it this way. So how do we implement this in R? Well, my variance, let's write it out for my variance, right? Function, we're gonna take X as an input and we should be able to do this pretty uh, simply. We're going to take the sum and we're going to take the difference between the scores in X and the mean of X. And we're gonna square all of those values and take their sum. So I'm just gonna space things out so it's easier to see. So we are squaring all of the uh, differences between X and the mean, so this will produce a large number of numbers. We'll sum it all up and we'll divide by the number of numbers. And that would do your variance for you. Let's just test it out. We've got some numbers. 
we load the variance in, we've got some numbers, and we're going to check out the variance of these numbers, which is 5.539. We could use the R function. We're gonna get a different number here, it's similar, but because R divides by N minus one, we get a different number. If we wanted to divide by N minus one, we could do it like this. And then we should get the same answer for this one and for this one, and we do. So we finished this problem. I do want to just quickly go through one more example here in case this part of the function was a little bit unclear. And I'm going to calculate by hand the variance for the variable a. So we have our a, which is again, all of our numbers. We wanna subtract from that the mean of a. So this gives us all of our differences or our deviations from the mean. Of course, if we sum these up, as we've learned, we get zero. Um, notice here, it's not actually zero. It's an extremely small number. Um, because we're using computers and because um, they have n not 100% precision, there's some rounding errors and we don't get exactly a zero but it's very, 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 very small. This is equivalent to zero. Uh, we want to take our deviations and square them so that we get these values. So these are the values inside the sum and they represent each of the deviations between the score and the mean squared. And then of course we wanna sum them all up, which is what we're doing here. So we sum them all up, we get a value also known as the sum of squared deviations or sum of squares. Then we divide those by N or the length of A. So there's our variance. This is for a population. If we wanna get the sample variance, we divide by n minus one. And in a next lab, we will learn about the difference between divided by n and n minus one. One of them is an unbiased estimator. The other one is a biased estimator. And we will be conducting simulations in R to demonstrate these properties to ourselves about the variance and standard deviation. Up next, the function for the standard deviation. We can just copy all of this work we did for the variance and modify it for the standard deviation. So I'll call it my standard dev. Remember the standard deviation is simply the square root of these things. This brings the values back down to their normal size. So all we need to do is add a square root, a square root everything. And let's check it out. We should get the same number. I've put in the standard deviation for a sample, which divides by n minus one. And the R formula is SD. We get the same answers. So we're done. Remember, your assignment is to do one of these and you don't have to do them all. However, it is a, a good skill to develop and I think if you wanted to do them all, that'd be great. Let's move on to the third problem. Okay, so this problem is to create a data frame with some means in it and then use ggplot to plot the means. So we're asked, imagine the same instructor taught a morning, afternoon, and evening section of a course, and there are these three average scores that these students in these sections get. We're gonna create a data frame representing this situation, then we're gonna put it into ggplot2 and plot it all. So 
we haven't talked much about how to do this, um, and that's why I'm giving you this generalization assignment. Don't worry, we'll talk more about data frames and uh, give explicit guidance on how to use them. So I want to say, create a data frame, and I'm going to give it the name of uh, my data. Why not? We're going to assign into it a data frame. Now, before we do that, I'm going to show you how I would go about building this. We need one vector for sections. This is going to include the information morning. afternoon and evening. Okay, there we go. And now we're going to put in, create another vector called grades, and we're going to just give the values here, uh, 0.85, 90, or let's do, sorry, let's just do 85, 90, and 93. Now these, see how they line up, the first one, second one, third one? These are in separate variables, separate vectors. We can combine them in a data frame just like this. All right, so when we look at sections, it's one vector with these three things in it. Look at grades, it's one vector with these three things in it. Now when we combine them into a data frame, we can see something that looks like this. It's a table. One column is called sections. One's got the different morning, afternoon, evening levels. And the other one is called grades. It has our averages. So we just made this by hand. And we're being asked to plot it. First of all, we need to call ggplot2 load the library. Now, at this point, you could just go back to the lab and let's find some ggplot examples. I would just go here, copy this, and see if we could modify it to solve this problem. So we have to put the name of our data frame that we made in here. Now we have to define the x variable. That's going to be uh, sections, because we want to plot each section as a different bar. So the name of that variable is sections. And then we want to plot the grades, the name of that variable. It's grades, so sorry, we want to plot grades on the y-axis. And here we have it. Press play. We can now plot a bar plot of the grades in each of the different sections. All right. In problem four, we're adding on one minor detail to what we just did. Now there's two instructors, and there's still grades for morning, afternoon, and evening, but for instructor one and for instructor two. So we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to copy it and extend it. Now notice in the above code, this is the first time I loaded this library. So that means any time I call ggplot after this line, it will work, but not before. And it also means I don't need to do this again. So I'm just going to delete this part. All right. Now, um, I'm going to make another variable called instructor. And let's represent this out as a long data format. So right now, we've got instructor 1. And the numbers for instructor 1 are 75, 78, and 80. So let's change those. 75, 78, and 80. Those are the numbers for morning, afternoon, and evening. But we've also got a second instructor. So where do we fit that second instructor in? We're going to do it just like this. We're going to add on. So after we've got all the information for instructor one done, we're going to add on a second. So now this one has six things. We need to add on those same things for sections and grades. So for instructor two, we need a morning, afternoon, evening. So we can just take all of this. 
pop it in there. And now we need the remaining three values, 88, 76, and 63. 88, 76, 63. Okay, I run all of these things and, oh, I forgot to add in the instructor. Let's do that here to our data frame. Now when we look at this, we've got a table with instructor sections and grades. And let me show you what happens if we plot this right now. It's sort of unclear what's going on. We have made a room for sections. The values are funny. They're adding up to like 150. And we have no way of separately looking at uh, instructor one and two. So we're going to add a group variable. And the group is instructor. Let's see what happens when we do that. Still not exactly what we're looking for. There's one more thing. And these are little details of ggplot that we're going to be more uh, specific about in other lectures. And right now we're just going to kind of experience them as we need them. So if you didn't know this was an option, th uh, that's been a deliberate decision on my part to walk you through these things in this way. So there's a thing we're gonna do we're going to set the position option to dodge. And now we can start to see something that's looking like bars for instructor one and bars for instructor two. But also, look, these bars are all the same color, and we can't tell what's going on very easily. So we could actually create another variable called color. And let's, I mean, Let's experiment. So we have now set the color to instructor. It's making the red bars for instructor one and the aqua bars for instructor two. And it turns out that the color option is going to set the color of the border. It's the fill option that's going to set the color of the bar. All right, and uh, we're gonna stop this example here. We've successfully created the data frame and plotted it this way. So let's go on to question number five. Import the WHR2018.csv file and then uh, accomplish these goals, finding for the years 2010 to 2015 what was the mean healthy life expectancy at birth for each year? Show your results in the table and a graph using ggplot. So if you go back to lab two and you start up here at practical number one, you'll find a zip file to download. Download this file. Unzip the folder. You will then have a folder called open underscore data. And you need to place that folder inside of your R project. So I don't have that here right now. I've downloaded it. I'm about to go get it and copy it into this folder. I'll be right back. I've copied it in. Here we have it. If we open up this folder, we can see some different data files that we'll be working with throughout the semester. Here is the WHR 2018 CSV file. And notice the location of this folder is in this root folder of Stats Lab 1, in the same folder as my RMD documents. These are the respective locations where everything needs to be in order for the next steps to work. So we want to read in the data from this file. And I can recall this, or we can go back to the example copy this and we're going to now read in a different file see if we can modify it so i'm just going to call this whr and rather than the gap binder data we are reading in whr 2018 it is a comma separated value file i believe it has headers let's take a look country life yeah, all the stuff at the top is headers so we should be able to read it in just like this and when we look at WHR, we can see what the data looks like now that it's in R. So we're being asked 
to compute the mean healthy life expectancy at birth for each of the years 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. We're going to use the dplyr library from the tidyverse. And you'll see, I'm just going to show you how to do it. It's pretty fast. So we're going to get the means. I'm just going to call this um, mean HLE. I'm going to make a pipe. First of all, we are going to filter, and I haven't talked about filter yet, but we're going to filter the data so that the years, and it's called year here, so year is greater than or equal to 2010, and the year is also less than or equal to 2015. If we do this one step, let's just do this and look at it. I, I needed to load the dplyr library. Now we can do that. Uh, so I've done the step, and now if we look at the years, it only contains years in that range, whereas the whole data set contains all the years. So this is a filtering operation. So we've filtered the rows um, so that all of the data contains year values in our range. The next thing we want to do is group our data by year. So now we can separately look at things for each of the years, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, which are the years in our data. Finally, we're going to summarize our data and we are going to calculate the mean of something. I'm just gonna quickly call this um, mean healthy. This is the name of a variable. And we need to go and find this in the data. So let's look over healthy dot life expectancy at birth. Here's the, the measure we're going to compute. Um, and as I start typing it in, it's actually being identified. So when we do this, we're done. Here's, here's the answer. Oh, there's a NA, so it didn't work. Now, why is that? This will happen all the time, finding little things that are unexpected. That's probably because as we scroll through here, actually, let's go to the top. I'm going to sort this. I'm going to sort it again. No. Well, that didn't necessarily help me. I suspect there are some not a numbers or NAs in the data. So there's a function, or there's a an option in the mean function called na.rm. This will remove those missing values before computing the mean. So let's see what that looks like. So when we did that, we are now computing the means. So that's a quick way to accomplish this goal. We need to print out the values in a table, and we could, we could have copied this from the assignment. And we want to make it a plot. So I'm just gonna go up here. We could probably copy this one. But the input is going to be the name of our new data frame called mean underscore HLE. The X axis will be the different years which is called year in our data frame. And then we've created a variable mean underscore healthy. That will be the y-axis. So let's take a look, see if all of this runs. And we've got our means and we've got a table. So if I knit all of this, we should start seeing that we've systematically solving all of these problems. Let's scroll down to the bottom. Yep, we found our different means and we've produced a plot. And I guess the, 
the mean is pretty similar across this year range. All right, let's go to the very last question. It's a repeat of the above, but in addition to calculating the means, we want to calculate the standard deviations for each year and then add error bars to the graph involving the standard deviations. All right, so we've already loaded the data in. We've already loaded dplyr. Let's just do all of this part again. We're going to modify it a little bit. So I'm coming down, make a code chunk, copy that in. And in addition to calculating the mean, which is being done all of this, I want to calculate the standard deviation. And just to double check, the SD function also has a na.rm that will remove not in numbers or not, that will remove missing values. So let's make this SD formula, keep that to be true. Test this out and we can see that we now have means and standard deviations. So we are ready to add our error bars I always forget how to write the code for error bars, so I always go back to my previous examples. Let's go back to the examples from the lab, finding error bars. Here they are. And we can just copy this part for the error bars, pop it in there, and make sure that our variable names match up. So we are going to be taking mean healthy and subtracting the SD healthy for the minimum values. I'm going to take mean healthy and adding SD healthy for the maximum values. And that should be good. So if we run this, we get our error bars added to the plot. All right, we've gone through all of the different problems. There's an advanced problem. I'm not going to review that here, but I think if you're interested in working on an advanced problem, there's no points for this. However, I encourage you to try it out. And at some point I will add another video going over that issue. But that is all. Uh, if I was you, I would be heading back to GitHub desktop, making a commit note, committing this, pushing it to the origin, and um, maybe even double checking that my work actually is on GitHub, so we can see that it is here. Um, looks like it's missing. I've reloaded. Yep. So we got, we added the data. We've got Lab Two, and uh, I would just take the link to this repository and submit it to Lab Two on Blackboard. And that's it for now.